This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 301 of the program. Today is Friday, August 6th, and before we begin, I want to take some time to thank all of the folks who make the show possible, all of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and Twitch supporters who signed up either last week to support us or increase the monthly pledge that they were already giving us, or maybe they even just submitted a one-time donation to us. These are the people who I want to thank. That includes Anne Marone, Crouching Dragon, Synvidia One, Socialist Maker, Soyborn, Solvim, Space Case Chris, and Teresa Gosnell. Thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you would also like to support the show, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com forward slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. So this week we have um a bit of a mixed bag here. You know, I'm not I'm not really sure. House to spin it. We'll talk about the absolutely uh, depressing outcome of the Democratic Party primary with Nina Turner. On top of that, we'll talk about the end of the eviction moratorium and the pressure that Cori Bush exerted on Democratic Party leadership. And ultimately, we'll talk about how she was successful at getting Joe Biden to do what she wanted. Also, Buffalo City Council's newest ploy to stop socialist India Walton is to basically abolish the position of mayor altogether so she can't become mayor or the position won't be there for long. So we'll talk about that. These are basically Stop the Steal Democrats. Um, Also, we'll discuss how the FCC is now trying to clean up the mess made by the least competent FCC chair, perhaps in the history of the country, Ajit Pai. We'll discuss the outcome of the New York Attorney General's investigation into Andrew Cuomo. We'll talk vaccine hesitancy and how a father of five died because he had COVID and his last words were that he regretted not getting vaccinated. And finally, we'll talk about how Ron DeSantis is basically on the side of the virus at this point. So that's what we've got. Let's uh, let's go ahead and get right to it. You know, this show is not one of those fun episodes, unfortunately. So yeah, enjoy it for uh, what it's worth. Hopefully you will at least find it somewhat informative. Well, the moratorium on evictions has expired as of August 1st. And now millions of Americans face eviction. Millions of Americans have unpaid rent or they're late on their rent. They have back rent owed. And now... There's no more federal protections for them. Yes, there is money being allocated at the state level sent by the federal government, but yet not all of that money has been used. In fact, just the small portion of that money has been used. So additional action was necessary, and we knew that additional action would be necessary. Back when the moratorium on evictions was extended to July 31st, at the end of June, we knew, okay, that's 30 more days to act. Something has to be done. But yet... People in power in the Democratic Party leadership, they didn't take the appropriate action. Biden's administration did nothing. The CDC did nothing. Uh, Congress did next to nothing. And now we are facing a crisis of epic proportions that is going to leave millions of people without homes. So having been unhoused before, Cori Bush is drawing attention to this issue by sleeping on the steps of the Capitol. And what she's doing is really, really important here because this is a PR nightmare for the president. It's a PR nightmare for individuals like Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and Democratic Party leadership who knew that this day was coming, but yet didn't take it seriously, didn't act with the urgency needed to take things seriously. And so the question is, what needs to be done to extend the moratorium on evictions and who has the authority to do it? And currently, all of the members of Democratic Party leadership are pointing towards each other and saying, well, no, you have to act. And then the other will respond saying, no, you have to act. And I wish I were kidding about this, but this is actually what's happening. First, Biden's press secretary says that the president supported the CDC extending the eviction moratorium. But then three days before the latest eviction moratorium was set to expire, Biden's administration then tried to pass the buck to Congress while doing absolutely nothing themselves. Meanwhile, Speaker Pelosi is calling on Biden to extend the eviction ban, implying that he has the authority to take the action that's necessary to stop this crisis. But while the White House says it's, quote, unable to find a way to extend the eviction ban after previously saying that the CDC should just do it, well, Biden's administration 
Commission insisted again that it just doesn't have the legal authority needed to extend the moratorium on evictions. And after sharing all of these headlines, Jordan Ull points out, incredible leadership on display here. And mind you, this back and forth has continued for days now. There's no action. But the fact that they're scrambling in and of itself speaks to the success of Cori Bush's pressure campaign because the spotlight's on Joe Biden and Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. And now they don't like that the heat is on them. And it doesn't help, especially when it comes to Nancy Pelosi for, for the optics, you know, there that the House is going to be on a recess for six weeks. They're not reconvening until September 20th. So right before this crisis started that you knew was coming, you all left and you didn't take meaningful action to stop it. And now you're trying to point the finger at, you know, one person and the other person. And we'll get to who I think is actually ultimately at blame here. But to speak to this back and forth, Nancy Pelosi and members of House Democratic Party leadership released a joint statement calling on the White House to extend the eviction moratorium. And now after previously supporting the idea of a CDC extension, well, now the White House is saying, mm, OK, we talked to the CDC and it doesn't necessarily seem like they can do much either. So this is per Jeff Stein of the Washington Post, Biden asked CDC on Sunday to consider 30-day eviction moratorium where COVID is rampant, but CDC director and her team have been unable to find legal authority for a new targeted eviction moratorium, White House pushing states and cities to speed up the spending of the money that was sent to them. So the Supreme Court ruled that the CDC doesn't have the legal authority to impose these moratoriums, so the Biden administration talked to the CDC director and said, can you find a more narrow eviction moratorium on areas hit the worst by COVID-19. And, you know, Rochelle Walensky said, we, we just don't have the legal authority to do that. Um, now, meanwhile, while Biden and Pelosi are pointing the fingers at each other, the vice president weighed in and uh, she was asked why the administration won't extend the eviction moratorium administratively as House Democrats say they can do. And then she responded saying, it's an important issue, very important issue, she said to me in the Senate referring to CNN reporter Manu Raju. Well, thank you so much for this bold statement, Madam Vice President. Without your leadership, without your courage here, I don't think anyone would know what to do. So I'm so glad that you chimed in to tell us what we already know, that this is very important. I mean, this just it is so bad for Democrats. And again, I want to remind you that they knew this day was coming, but yet they're scrambling currently because finally somebody, Cori Bush, decided to hold their feet to the fire and draw attention to this is issue. We are facing one of the most serious crises in the history of the United States, where millions of people are about to be evicted from their homes and those of you in power who were elected, you, you don't know what to do. So in terms of like who actually is to blame, my answer is all of them. They're all to blame. Joe Biden, the CDC, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, everyone with power who's in leadership is to blame. And it's because they should be doing everything they can right now to stop this crisis. So let me tell you what I would have done in this situation. As president... I would have directed the CDC to extend the moratorium on evictions regardless of what the courts had to say before, and then that sets up a legal challenge. Of course, they're going to strike it down, but that buys you a little bit of time. You tell them to extend the moratorium on evictions, and you do what you can uh, via executive order to also maybe embolden the CDC here. And on top of that, while that's happening, the House has to take action to extend it legislatively through Congress as well. So all of these things can be done simultaneously. You can also do uh, everything in your power to assist states in being more efficient at getting out these funds because a lot of them, they received this money and there was no like existing system that they had set up. So they're trying to create the infrastructure to distribute the money that they got from the federal government to people to stop you know, them from getting evicted. And they're kind of left scrambling because they don't know what to do. So we need more time currently is the issue. And it doesn't matter that the CDC is going to get struck down in the courts if they, ex you know, extend this eviction moratorium. Do it anyway. Subvert their authority and do it anyway. Buy time because you, you can't just allow this to happen as Congress goes on recess for six weeks and people are losing their homes. You can't allow it to happen, but they are allowing it to happen. And that's why I say they're all to blame. They're all to blame because you knew 
this was coming. And when we knew we had until the end of July, that still wasn't enough. But now the eviction moratorium has expired and only now they're taking it seriously. And they wouldn't have taken this seriously had Cori Bush not exerted pressure on them. Had Cori Bush not got all of the mainstream media to pay attention to what she's doing right now. So good on Cori Bush. The fact that Democratic Party leadership cannot get their act together and they're busy playing the blame game is so embarrassing. This is going to be a bad look come 2022. And they should all feel ashamed with themselves for not caring about this issue because that's exactly what the issue is here. They don't care enough. That's why they're only focusing on this now because somebody is forcing them to. So this is a huge crisis that we are now dealing with. Who knows how many people have already been evicted. It's just, it's bad. Lately, we've been talking a lot about the growing authoritarianism within the GOP, thanks to Donald Trump and his stop the steal nonsense. But there's a lot of Democrats who basically are as equally maniacal and nefarious when it comes to subverting the will of the people and hurting democracy if it serves their political interests. So the city of Buffalo in New York, they are considering an entirely new type of governance. I mean, it's not that new, but they're thinking um, we'll be charitable here and we'll, we'll call it innovatively, right? They're trying to, rather than having like this old antiquated position of mayor, they want to try to create this position of city manager. Because perhaps since mayors in the past haven't been great, this is going to be a better way to better serve the people of Buffalo. Now, as I read you the details of this story, this is a brief story, but as I read this to you, question why they would be planning something like this. I mean, there's a bit of a spoiler behind me if you've heard about this story before, but nonetheless, like, think to yourself, what would make them want to do something like this? So, the Buffalo News reports, the Buffalo Common Council will explore a city manager form of governance to replace the office of mayor. Under such a plan, a city manager would be selected by the nine-member council in conjunction with the community to carry out the will of the council members, University Council Member Rashid N. C. Wyatt told the Buffalo News. The report is due in 90 days, about two weeks before the November mayoral election in which Byron Brown, this is the incumbent mayor, is waging a write-in campaign after losing the Democratic primary to political upstart India Walton. Any change that eliminates the office of mayor would have to come via a citywide ballot referendum, which would be all but impossible to get on the ballot by November. The council, which goes into recess in August, adopted the resolution Tuesday. South City Council member Christopher P. Scanlon voted in the negative, saying a majority of five council members selecting a city manager instead of tens of thousands of voters appointing a mayor could lead to some, quote, nefarious behavior. Yeah, I'll say. It's almost as if just subverting the will of the people in order to unilaterally appoint someone to be the mayor or city manager is a bad idea because that is deeply authoritarian. Now, it's not like parties choosing who the leader will be is unheard of in democracies. I mean, in parliamentary systems, the prime minister is the individual who's the leader of the party who gets the most votes. But here, what they're specifically doing and why it's authoritarian uh, is they're trying to get rid of a role because they don't like the outcome of the election. And therefore, they're trying to actively subvert the will of the people. That is deeply authoritarian and it's nefarious. What this is about is that somebody who they don't like beat the person who they do like. And in order to stop her from winning an election that she is overwhelmingly likely to win, they just want to get rid of her position altogether. And it is incredibly transparent. And it's bad enough that the individual who she beat, Byron Brown, the four-term incumbent, he's refusing to concede. He won't concede. He was defeated in the Democratic Party primary by an insurgent socialist candidate, and rather than refusing to concede, he's uh, using a couple of tricks out of Trump's playbook, and he's calling her a radical socialist, and he's running a write-in campaign. A write-in campaign. So these Democrats, make no mistake about it, they are no better than the Stop the Steal Republicans. They are no better than the Republicans in states like Georgia and Texas who are passing these voter suppression laws, voter ID laws, you know, uh, reducing mail-in voting and uh, ballot drop boxes. These Democrats are no better than those Republicans because they're literally trying to rig the process so they create a government that is more favorable to them ideologically. And that is deeply, deeply disgusting and authoritarian. And it really, like, it goes to show you how far 
these Democrats in Buffalo are willing to go to stop democracy from taking place. The people of Buffalo elected India Walton. She won. She beat the four-term incumbent. Deal with it. Get over it. You don't get to choose to subvert their will because you don't like who they chose. Too bad. Oftentimes, elections don't go our way. But that doesn't mean that you get to just do away with the position entirely to stop her from becoming mayor. This is insanity. Like, the fact that they're even considering this. They should be embarrassed with themselves. Anyone who voted in favor of this, they should be ashamed of themselves. Just admit that you hate democracy. I mean, imagine if the Senate, which was controlled by Republicans in 2020, if they didn't like that Joe Biden beat Donald Trump. So instead, what they chose to do was uh, replace the position of president with prime minister and just like appoint someone to that position um, so that way they didn't have to deal with Joe Biden taking power. These Democrats in Buffalo, I think, would rightfully call out those authoritarian Republicans who are very clearly and deliberately trying to subvert the will of voters. But when they do it at the local level, they think it's it's perfectly reasonable. And sure, it's the case that this isn't going to take effect, even if it were to take effect before she you know, assumes power. But still, if they can get rid of this position altogether and limit the amount of influence that voters have, or if nothing else, scare voters into thinking that their votes are going to be taken away from them when it comes to mayor, if they don't, if they vote for someone who the city council doesn't like, it's just, you know, mission accomplished for them. So they should be absolutely embarrassed. Uh, every single person who voted in favor of this should be resigning. There should be mass pressure uh, from uh, the people of Buffalo on city council here to get them to all step down because they are very clearly coming out in favor of getting rid of democracy. And that is disgusting. Like, the thing about democracy is that you need people to buy into democracy. You need people to accept the outcomes of elections. This is what I've been preaching nonstop for months now about the Republican Party. So when people do it on the Democratic Party side, it also has to be called out. Like, this is just, this is gross. But I mean, it's exactly what we'd expect from authoritarian stop the steal type of Democrats. Back in 2020, even individuals like Joe Biden floated this idea of getting superdelegates to override the will of voters if Bernie Sanders was selected, but he didn't have like a majority of pledged delegates. So this isn't the first time that Democrats have shown their authoritarian cards, but this is something that cannot stand. It's something that cannot stand. Anytime Democrats stoop to this level and they're no better than Republicans, they have to be called out and they have to be pressured to leave office and resign because this is totally unacceptable. Longtime viewers know that I used to talk about net neutrality on this channel all the time, especially in 2017, but also 2018 as well. And even if you've only seen a couple of those videos, I think it was abundantly clear about the point that I was trying to drive home that Ajit Pai, this individual, not only is he a terrible human being, but he is one of the most shameless industry shills we've ever seen, perhaps, in American government. And I get that the bar is very high to pass, right? Because there's a lot of really corrupt, sold-out people in D.C. But this individual, he was former legal counsel to Verizon, and when he was elevated from FCC commissioner to FCC chair, he made it very clear he had one mission and one mission only repeal net neutrality and ruin the internet so that way my uh, my industry, my people, they actually can make a lot more profit off of people. Now, thankfully, um, his agenda largely didn't go anywhere because he repealed net neutrality, got a little bit too greedy because he tried to preempt states from creating their own net neutrality laws and the court said you can't do that. So now most people live in states where net neutrality is protected. So, you know, he, he failed there with that mission. And, you know, he, he did a lot more than that. I think just saying that he was there to repeal net neutrality was a bit of an oversimplification, if I can reflect on the last two minutes. He also tried to undo any of the progress that was made throughout the Obama era with Tom Wheeler as the chair of the FCC, even moving towards trying to get rid of zero rating, which is, you know, these uh, regulations on your data and throttling you when you go over. Uh, but having said that, he, he tried to pretend as if he wasn't this big shill for the industry and make it seem as if he actually had another goal there as FCC chair, not just totally operate at the behest of the industry, Comcast, Verizon, AT&T, but he also really wanted to make sure that Americans have access to the internet, even in rural areas. He wanted to bridge the digital divide, as he called it. So he launched this initiative to create the infrastructure needed 
to bridge the digital divide, right? He wanted to make sure that people in rural areas had access to quality, high-speed internet. Except not only is he corrupt, he's also an idiot. And we're learning now, based on an analysis by a watchdog of the FCC in the industry, that he was horrible at the one goal that he claimed to be so passionate about. And honestly, this is so embarrassing, and this individual should never be able to get a job anywhere like near internet or broadband ever again even if he is the shill that he was because the things that he did in an effort to bridge the so-called digital divide laughable so for more on this we go to andrea germanos of common dreams who explains under the leadership of pi who was appointed by former president donald trump the fcc awarded 180 bidders contracts to expand broadband to underserved areas pi in a december statement touted the auction as an incredible success and declared the program the single largest step ever taken to bridge the digital divide digital rights advocacy group free press dug into those claims and the bids outlined by companies to help purportedly unconnected areas the group Group found Pi's program was on track to be one of the most wasteful projects in FCC history in light of bids to cover empty parking lots and urban areas already well connected. Wow. The FCC's Monday statement appears to reference those findings and directs those who won grants to withdraw their requests if they don't meet the program's mandate. Quote, in light of complaints that the program was poised to fund broadband to parking lots and well-served urban areas, the FCC sent letters to 197 winning bidders. The letters offer providers an opportunity to withdraw their funding requests from those places already with service or where significant questions of waste have been raised. Next, the FCC made clear that it will not tolerate any provider participating in the program that is not serious about providing broadband service or has not made appropriate efforts to secure state approvals. To this end, the FCC rejected requests from AB Indiana in Florida and LTD Broadband in California, Oklahoma, and Kansas to waive program deadlines lines in light of their failure to act in a timely way to seek state certification. Free Press noted Monday that Starlink, Elon Musk's satellite internet company, was among those receiving the new FCC letters. Now, before we discuss this, in regards to that last uh, sentence there, Ajit Pai awarded Elon Musk's company Starlink close to $1 billion. $1 billion. So I just want to reiterate how big of a disaster this was. The analysis that was conducted is saying that what he called an incredible success might be one of the most wasteful projects in the history of the FCC. I mean, how embarrassed he should feel right now, but he doesn't care because he didn't actually ever care about this. This was just kind of like a red herring to distract us from the fact that all he cared about was ruining the internet at the behest of his former employer and probably future employer. I'm sure that he has a cushy job lined up for him at Verizon or AT&T after doing exactly what they sent him there to do or pushed for him to get there to do. Um, but he literally had contracts awarded to people who already had broadband in those areas who were going to serve areas that were already covered. And on top of that, covering empty parking lots. I just, wow. I just, I don't know what to say. This is why you shouldn't let um, unserious people who are just shills for the industry in positions of government, in powerful positions like this, because they end up doing something like this that he very clearly didn't care about at all. Now, even if you don't care about something like this, he has a lot of people around him that can actually competently um, oversee this program, but he, he literally couldn't care less. He didn't care at all. Hence why, you know, areas that were already covered were getting covered. He just, he, he couldn't be bothered. Wow. So it's not like this is shocking at all because, you know, part of my coverage about Ajit Pai, it doesn't just emphasize how corrupt he is and how many conflicts of interest there are, but it also talks about how idiotic and narcissistic he is. Like the level of self-awareness that he lacks is so embarrassing Wow. I mean, he, you had one job. You had one thing that you said you cared about. And this is what you do? Give empty parking lots broadband to Pie. This is your crowning achievement during your tenure as a FCC chair? 
Wow. I, again, it's like, I don't want to pretend as if I'm surprised here because this is exactly what I expected to find once independent audits were conducted uh, or analyses were conducted over like this entire program. But it's just, it's incredibly embarrassing. And the fact that the FCC now with competent people in power, Jessica Rosenworcel, who's the acting FCC chair is incredibly brilliant. Um, but now she's having to go through and like clean up the mess that you made and undo all of the damage that you caused. And you should be embarrassed. Like you should never be able to get a job in government or even in the private sector again, especially as it relates to this, because wow, what, what an idiot Ajit Pai is. Well, I'm sure that by now you're all aware of the fact that there was a very, very important Democratic Party primary taking place in the 11th Congressional District of Ohio between Nina Turner and Chantel Brown. And if you haven't heard the results, just um, click out of this video and remain in ignorant bliss because this is going to ruin your day if you were hoping that we'd have one of the most important fighters elected to Congress because Nina Turner lost. Now, it is the case that not all of the votes have been counted at the time that I record this video, but with more than 75% of precincts reporting, it is the case that Chantel Brown has defeated Nina Turner 49.8% to 44.7%. So to kind of put things into perspective for you, Chantel Brown, someone with little to no name recognition, made up a 35-point deficit and ended up pretty handily defeating someone who's a political behemoth like Nina Turner with national name recognition. Ask yourself, how on earth did this happen? Well, the answer is actually pretty simple. Money. And that might be a little bit of an oversimplification, but just look at how much money was spent against Nina Turner here and see how much money Nina Turner spent. And I think that you'll get a pretty clear picture as to why this race turned out the way it did. So as HuffPost's Daniel Morans explains, when it comes to pro-Turner or anti-Brown spending, there was just over $900,000 spent. However, when it comes to pro-Brown or anti-Turner spending, $2.7 million. So Nina Turner here was the underdog. Nina Turner was heavily disadvantaged. And when you look at this chart provided to us by Kirk Botto on Twitter, you can see that just one super PAC basically made the entire difference here. It is the Democratic Majority for Israel PAC who Chantel Brown petitioned to get in the race for her. So they spent almost $2 million on behalf of Chantel Brown to oppose Turner and support Brown. And all of these other smaller groups, such as MoveOn.org, National Nurses United, Ohio Women Rising, I mean, they spent on behalf of Nina Turner, but I mean, it pales in comparison here. And the only one that came close to any of the anti-Turner packs third way was the democratic action pack but still they were outspent by third way who spent lots of money almost five hundred thousand dollars to oppose nina turner so when you look at those charts it's really easy to see why nina turner lost here how Chantel brown was able to do what was seemingly impossible money and this is why i am very clear about the need to decommodify elections and get money out of politics because it shouldn't be the case that money dictates who wins and loses elections. But unfortunately, that is the reality of the system that we live in. And that's really unfortunate. And I just want to say, you're, you're watching this video, you're reading the news, and I know what you're feeling. Because guess what? I feel it too. I feel gutted. I feel demoralized. I feel depressed even, genuinely depressed. And we needed this victory. We needed this victory after the loss, after the, the sting of 2020, after we all still feel that we needed this victory because Nina Turner is the real deal. Nina Turner wouldn't just be a plus one vote to all of the progressive priorities in Congress. She wouldn't just be a plus one to the squad in Congress. Nina Turner is a leader. Nina Turner would be a fighter vociferously so for Medicare for all, for the Green New Deal, for student debt cancellation. And who knows what Nina Turner could have accomplished. Today alone, we learned how important electing progressives to Congress is. Because Cori Bush single-handedly got the Biden administration to extend the moratorium on evictions. How? By simply sl sleeping on the steps of the Capitol for five days, being relentless. So imagine if Cori Bush never defeated Lacey Clay in 2020. 
it might still be the case that we are facing a national eviction crisis, even to a worse extent than we are now. Cori Bush did that. So imagine what Nina Turner could have accomplished had she been elected. And even though you're feeling depressed and nothing I say is going to convince you or make you feel inspired, one you know silver lining is that Nina Turner is a fighter and she's not going to go away. Like This isn't the last of Nina Turner, obviously, and I do believe that her political career is going to flourish. I do believe she will one day be successful, whether it's in Congress or as a governor. I don't know. Nina Turner is an icon. She is a leader. And leaders don't just go away with one election loss. Bernie Sanders, you know, he wasn't immediately electorally successful. It, it takes time. Losses are inevitable. They're baked into the into the process. But that doesn't make us feel any better. Being reminded of the fact that, yeah, you know, losses are inevitable. That doesn't make us feel any better because the situation is rapidly deteriorating in the United States and around the globe. And we just need one more voice to to, like, move us a little bit closer in the right direction. And it's not like Nina Turner was the panacea. It's not like Nina Turner alone could solve all of the country and the world's problems, but just having her there as a fighter would have made a measurable difference. And now it's over. And to make matters worse, if you click on the trending tab on Twitter and you click on Nina Turner's name, you see corporate Democrats celebrating individuals like Yvette Nicole Brown. Loving every moment of this, celebrating you see corporate Democrats um, like Tom Watson. You see uh, Bush-era Republicans turned anti-Trump Republicans who are uh, saying, hey, Chantel Brown won. Now it's time to uh, celebrate. I don't know if it was Bill Kristol, but I mean, you know, the the general people, the blue check mark, um, you know, Democratic Party, loyalist liberals on Twitter who um, were terrible during the 2020 Democratic Party primaries, like they all reared their ugly heads again. But another component to Nina Turner's loss here is that the left just, the left wasn't all on board here. And that's something that absolutely has to be discussed because yes, it was the case that big money probably was, was the defining characteristic of this race. There are other things that we have to explore. And I want the left to use this defeat to do some serious soul searching about what we're going to do as a movement collectively. And there's no leadership here, right? We are a decentralized movement. We're a bunch of misfits and edgelords online. So it's not like we're going to form some sort of a think tank tank and emerge with a consensus but we have to do some soul searching folks just as individuals be a little bit introspective about what went wrong and i'm just gonna i'm gonna be frank there's a lot of leftists who didn't just not participate in this election to help nina turner but actively tried to sabotage nina turner and it happened from the beginning. Like when I did my interview with Nina Turner to promote her campaign, I saw portions of it clipped out online where people on the left supposedly were trying to disparage Nina Turner. That's incredibly harmful. I saw some podcasts who purport to be on the left quite literally discourage their viewers from donating to Nina Turner, knowing the damage that that could cause. Because Nina Turner was going to be outspent. And at that point, we knew that these super PACs were bankrolling Nina Turner's opponent. So I saw a lot of leftists all basically discounting Nina Turner, brushing her aside as if this victory was um, unimportant. Well, now you're going to see the difference. Now you get to see a corporate Democrat like Chantel Brown, who's not going to listen to you at all, who's going to ignore you, who's not going to support Medicare for all, who doesn't support student debt cancellation, who doesn't support housing as a human right. Now you get to see the difference between Nina Turner and Chantel Brown and the individuals who either didn't support Nina Turner actively and sound the alarm, make some noise for Nina Turner, or actively discourage people from donating to Nina Turner's campaign, you get to own this. You get to own this. You know who you are. You get to own this defeat because you align with the corporate Democrats. Wittingly or unwittingly, you have been a useful idiot for the DNC, so congratulations. Anyone who is pretending as if Nina Turner would be a useless addition to Congress, you get to own this. You know who you are. Anyone who claimed that Nina Turner would be as ineffectual as other members of the squad, you get to own this. 
you get to see firsthand the difference between another corporate Democrat and Nina Turner. And this is why I was very adamant about the fact that we don't use phrases like fraud squad, right? I didn't want to do that because you implicitly suggest that members of the squad are so ineffectual that electing more progressives to Congress basically is a meaningless endeavor. There's no point to it. But in actuality, it is really important. As much as I have my criticisms of the squad, the fraud squad narrative, which also ended up harming individuals like Nina Turner because she was associated with the squad and they campaigned for her. That was bad because when you say fraud squad, you suggest that there's no value to having members of the squad in Congress when Cori Bush today demonstrated her value. When AOC this week is playing hardball when it comes to infrastructure, threatening to torpedo the entire infrastructure bill because the reconciliation package is being watered down by corporate Democrats. And yes, that's not to say that constructive criticism is uh, never allowed. Of course it's allowed, but you have to draw a line between criticism that's constructive and criticism that's destructive. And what I saw through a large portion, if not the majority of Nina Turner's race, was discourse that was incredibly destructive. And people who go out of their way to demonize members of the squad, not constructively but destructively for views and clicks... Nina Turner is automatically viewed as uh, implicitly culpable there. All of AOC and um, Ayanna Presley and uh, Cori Bush's perceived failures are also failures that are uh, applied to Nina Turner as well, unfortunately, because, you know, she was basically running as an addition to the squad. She was running as an extension of Bernie Sanders' movement. And if you claim that Bernie Sanders is a failure altogether and he's useless in the squad, they're failures altogether and they're fraud squads, then... This is what happens. You cultivate widespread pessimism and people choose to check out. So people choose to not donate to Nina Turner. People who otherwise would have supported Nina Turner, gone to Ohio and campaigned for Nina Turner, choose to not do that because they've been, uh, they've been told that you know it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if Nina Turner is in Congress or not. And in the short term... Sure, that might be the case that Nina Turner alone isn't going to change everything, but what I've seen from the left is just so, so destructive, and I don't even know how to characterize it. I don't even know what to say. People were calling Nina Turner a sellout before she even had the chance to be elected. So anyone who participated in, in that discourse, any podcast who promoted this idea that Nina Turner was bad or useless and wouldn't be an adequate fighter sufficiently for the progressive left, you get to own this loss. Congratulations. You are a useful idiot for the Democratic Party establishment. You are a tool for Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and Joe Biden. They're very thankful that you, you know, um, fostered this narrative that Nina Turner isn't worth fighting for. And again, I don't want to make it seem as if this is the reason why Nina Turner lost, right? Because ultimately, even if the entirety of the left was united, um, I, I think that basically when money gets involved, it's really difficult to kind of change that momentum in the opposite direction. But would the additional support from leftists online for Nina Turner have helped? Unquestionably. If Nina Turner didn't have to respond to and address criticisms from leftists who are already preemptively disappointed in her before she's already elected, would that, if she didn't have to waste her time responding to that, would that have helped? Absolutely. So anyone who pushed this bullshit, you own this fucking mess right here. You own this. You know who I'm talking to. We're going to be upset. We're going to be angry. We're going to be depressed. And if you need to take time to check out of electoral politics for a little bit and stop consuming political news. I think that that's healthy. I think that that's understandable. Uh, understand that this is a, what you're feeling right now, the depression, the disillusionment. This is a very human response. And it's why, folks, I was very adamant that we take this race seriously. Why the minute we started to see poll numbers shift, I was trying to do everything in my power to convince leftists that we have to take this seriously. Like, I know that you get this 
impression that everything was copacetic and it was trending towards Nina Turner being victorious because, hey, look how exciting everything is. We have Cornell West and Bernie Sanders and AOC canvassing for Nina Turner. I promise you, though, that to me was not a sign of a looming victory. That was a sign to freak the fuck out because I'm sure that her internal polling showed that she was at risk of losing and then she contacted Bernie Sanders and AOC and told them, we're at risk of losing the seat here. You've got to help me. So people probably expected Nina Turner to win this because hell, it's Nina Turner, right? But again, this is why I say you can't take any seat for granted. Now, I don't know if maybe the result would have been different had Nina Turner run in 2022 when the DMFI can't, you know, focus all of their resources on one particular race. I'm not sure. But what you need to do is not let this moment lead to you being disempowered and checking out because that's exactly what the Democratic Party establishment wants. They want you to be disillusioned with the process. They want you to check out of electoral politics. I feel that instinct as well, but I fight it. And do you want to know why I fight it? Because even if every single candidate that I support and endorse going forward loses their election, I still take satisfaction knowing that I am a pain in the ass of these corporate Democrats who desperately want us to check out. I want them to know that regardless of how many times we're kicked in the teeth and punched in the gut, I'm going to get back up again and I'm going to force them to spend all of this money on these races to defeat us because I'm never fucking stopping. I'm going to be a pain in their ass forever, for as long as I possibly can, because I'm not going to grant them the satisfaction knowing that I'm going to check out. In fact, I'm going to be that much louder about the progressives that I support in the next election cycle. So understand, folks, the feelings that you're feeling are natural and they're valid and quite frankly, they're warranted. I feel very, very defeated right now. And there's nothing that I can say to make you feel inspired because look, the system itself is absolutely ruthless. And there's going to be other candidates in the future who most of which we support, they're going to they're gonna be defeated by big money like this. But each election cycle, so long as we get another AOC, so long as we get one more Cory Bush and Jamal Bowman, so long as we keep inching closer towards victory, even if it's not at the speed that we need, to stop us from going off this cliff, we're still making progress. The fact that they view us as the threat to where they felt it was necessary to spend $2 million, that shows that we do have them afraid. And there's going to be a lot more losses down the pipeline. We're going to lose a lot of elections. In 2022, we're going to feel the same feeling that we're feeling now. But guess what? Maybe there's going to be another primary victory. Maybe Amy Valella wins her race. We don't know. But I know that all of our victories are not going to come to us if we check out. So take time that you need to recover mentally. Take time to collect your thoughts. And I want the left to be introspective going forward. I want the left to really get serious, for lack of a better word. And I want us to understand who the enemy is click on the nina turner name on twitter look at that uh click on the latest post and you're gonna see who the fuck the enemy is it's not other leftists it's not members of the squad you'll see who the enemies are okay so i mean i'm just rambling at this point i don't know what else is left to say this was a victory that we desperately needed but um unfortunately we lost thanks to big money for five days, Representative Cory Bush slept on the steps of the Capitol in an attempt to draw attention to the issue that is the looming eviction crisis that will result because of the expiration on the moratorium on evictions. And members of the Democratic Party leadership just, they didn't take this seriously. They knew that the expiration was approaching, but yet they didn't take it seriously. So she wanted members of the Democratic Party in Congress to reconvene. She wanted Joe Biden to take action. And because she was there for so long, because she was so persistent and relentless and got the media to pay attention, that sent members of the Democratic Party's leadership scrambling because this is a really bad look. This is a PR disaster. So guess what? Cori Bush, she won. She got exactly what was necessary. She got Joe Biden to unilaterally extend the moratorium on evictions single-handedly so 
don't be mistaken about this. This is specifically what happens when you elect progressive members of Congress. Had Cori Bush not defeated Lacey Clay in 2020, who knows where we'd be currently because she had the idea of being formally unhoused herself to make noise about this. And guess what? It paid off. And this is really, really important. She writes via Twitter, on Friday night, I came to the Capitol with my chair. I refused to accept that Congress could leave for vacation while 11 million people faced eviction. For five days, we've been out here demanding that our government acts to save lives. Today, our movement moved mountains. And that is exactly right. Because as Jeff Stein of the Washington Post points out, Biden administration expected to announce new ban slash limits on evictions. Details TK. But likely more limited than prior national ban follows major pushback from progressive House Democrats. So again, this reporter, Jeff Stein, is saying this is specifically the result of progressive House Democrats fighting for it. And while Cori Bush remains on the steps of the Capitol, or remained on the steps of the Capitol to fight for an extension on the moratorium on evictions, uh, AOC has been threatened to to torpedo the infrastructure bill. And that's really important given that the reconciliation piece is getting watered down by the conservatives in Congress. So uh, basically the point that I want you all to, to see me make here is that it is really important to get members of Congress who are progressive elected. Nina Turner could have been another voice here to fight for us. And sure, there would have been times maybe where Nina Turner uh, does something that I disagree with. She makes a political calculation that I don't like or makes me feel uncomfortable, or she isn't there when I need her to be for a particular vote. But ultimately, at the end of the day, having these members of Congress there to fight for what we also want is really, really invaluable. So to the naysayers, who were shitting on Cori Bush, saying that this was all performative and it's not going to lead to anything, all of you get to eat crow right now because she just proved you wrong. Yeah, she actually cares. She actually cares. And think about what she got Biden to reveal here. She got him to implicitly reveal that he was lying because as Sam Sachs points out, this comes after the White House repeatedly said it didn't have the authority to do it. They were lying, just like they're lying about all the other stuff they claim they can't do. Remember when they claim they can't wipe out student loan debt? And that's exactly it. So she bought millions of Americans more time. So the moratorium on evictions was uh, extended and now Congress has to take action necessary to address this legislatively. Cori Bush did that. So I'm absolutely pleased that she did that. Now, I just want to point out that, you know, when I talked about this previously, I made it abundantly clear that a lot of the issue here was the, the Democratic Party's incompetence. And that's a large part of the picture as well, because they knew that the deadline was coming and they chose not to act. And Nancy Pelosi made the decision to allow Congress to go on recess, knowing that this crisis was ahead. Joe Biden knew that the, you know, the eviction moratorium was running out and they all chose to not act. And now they're blaming each other. And of course, that is the result of competence, but it's not just incompetence. And to say that, you know, incompetence alone was Part of the problem here would be, you know, an oversimplification because another issue is corruption. And this headline pretty much says it all. So as Julia Conley of Common Dreams reports, Democrats took millions from real estate interests before allowing eviction moratorium to end. So it wasn't as if they were surprised the moratorium on evictions suddenly expired. They knew that there was a deadline approaching, but they chose not to act because they took legalized bribes. So for more on this, Conley explains, as Andrew Perez and Joel Warner reported in the Daily Poster on Tuesday, the chairman of both the real estate brokerage firm Marcus and Milchap and the real estate investment trust SX Property Trust donated $1 million to the House Majority Pack on June 1st, days after the CDC extended the moratorium until late June. Chairman George Marcus also donated $263,400 that same month to a committee that benefits the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's campaign and contributed at least $6.5 million to PACs that work to elect Democrats to the Senate and the House. The Daily Poster suggested that while Marcus and his companies are wealthy, with the chairman part of a group of landlords whose personal fortunes increased by nearly $25 billion since the pandemic began, both Marcus and Millichap and Essex Property Trust stood to benefit from the eviction moratorium being allowed to expire. So corruption is an issue here, which really, I think, makes what Cory Bush accomplished that much more impressive because she got them to take action that was against what their donors wanted. 
So this is basically a story that really proves the importance of electing more progressives to Congress. I get that people from time to time are going to have con constructive criticism of members of the squad. I do myself. I get that from time to time. People are going to disagree with elected officials who are there to represent us, seemingly. But overall, these are individuals who are new to Congress who are trying to find ways to utilize the power that they have, knowing that they are a minority in Congress, and yet they're still incredibly effective given the limited scope of their power in Congress. And that's really important. That's worth something. It's worth fighting for people like Cory Bush. It's worth fighting for people like Nina Turner. And let Nina Turner's defeat, as well as Cory Bush's success here, serve as a lesson for all of us going forward. When we see an opportunity arise... For a progressive member of Congress to get elected, let's not pass it up. Like, let's not just like assume that they're going to be sellouts and you know cave to the establishment and not get involved in that race. Let's actually get involved and fight for them, because it's worth fighting for people who are going to fight for us, even if at times they disagree with us on strategy, even if at times they make political decisions that we can't necessarily understand or agree with understand that ultimately they are our allies and it is really important that we send more of individuals that are similar to Cory Bush to Congress. I think that should be really clear to people now. So by the time you see this video, even if it is highly unlikely, I would hope that Governor Andrew Cuomo of New York has resigned because the details that came out after New York Attorney General Letitia James concluded her investigation into his office really prove that this individual should be nowhere near power given how likely he is to abuse his power and sexually harass and assault women who are in his vicinity. I mean, it's truly morally reprehensible that this individual is allowed to remain in power, but hopefully we're talking seriously about impeachment. Hopefully individuals in the Democratic Party are not going to let him get away with this and allow him to kind of skirt accountability when the news cycle stops talking about him because this is truly morally reprehensible. And rather than reading you an article about the findings, I just want you to hear the New York Attorney General explain it herself as to what she found after she finished this investigation. He reviewed more than 74,000 pieces of evidence, including documents, emails, texts, audio files, and pictures. These interviews and pieces of evidence reveal a deeply disturbing yet clear picture. Governor Cuomo sexually harassed current and former state employees in violation of both federal and state laws. The independence investigation found that Governor Cuomo sexually harassed multiple women, many of whom were young women, by engaging in unwanted groping, kisses, hugging, and by making inappropriate comments. Further, the governor and his senior team took actions to retaliate against at least one former employee for coming forward with her story, her truth. And Governor Cuomo's administration fostered a toxic workplace that enabled harassment and created a hostile work environment where staffers did not feel comfortable coming forward with complaints about sexual harassment due to a climate of fear and given the power dynamics. The investigators found that Governor Cuomo's actions and those of the exec executive chamber violated multiple state and federal laws, as well as the executive chamber's own written policies. This investigation has revealed conduct that corrodes the very fabric and character of our state government and shines light on injustice that can be present at the highest levels of government. But none of this, none of this would have been illuminated if not for the heroic women who came forward. And I am inspired by all the brave women who came forward. But more importantly, I believe them. I do too. Now, in spite of uh, the tens of thousands of pieces of information and evidence that she reviewed in this case, Andrew Cuomo is just denying all of it, literally 
all of it. Very Trumpian of him. He says, I want you to know directly from me that I never touched anyone inappropriately or made inappropriate sexual advances. Cuomo said, I'm 63 years old. I've lived my entire adult life in public view. That is just not who I am. And that's not who I have ever been. Yeah, except nobody buys this now. Nobody buys it. And even Joe Biden, the president of the United States, has called on him to resign. So that is as much political pressure as you could basically expect from a sitting official. But that's not all. Congress members from New York are also calling on him to resign, some for a second time. As Politico's Aaron Durkin explains, on Tuesday, Senators Chuck Schumer and Kirsten Gillibrand again called for him to quit. Representative Jerry Nadler, Carolyn Maloney, Brian Higgins, Nydia Velasquez, Richie Torres, Yvette Clark, Kathleen Rice, Grace Mang, Adriano Espaid, Jamal Bowman, Munder Jones, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has issued a joint statement saying Cuomo should face impeachment if he will not resign. The group cited Cuomo's own statement from 2013 calling for the resignation of then-Assembly member Vito Lopez over sexual misconduct allegations, saying there must be a zero-tolerance policy towards sexual harassment. We agree, the members of Congress said. So what's frustrating is his refusal to even entertain the idea of him resigning amid a very serious scandal. And it's not like this is the only scandal that Andrew Cuomo is dealing with. There's also the nursing home scandal where there are lots of deaths because of him. And he hid that information. So it's it's deeply, deeply frustrating to see this. But thankfully, it seems as if Democrats are trying to hold one of their own accountable. And in fact, Assembly Speaker Carl Heasty is saying that he's already going to uh, expedite the impeachment process if he doesn't willingly step down. And this is incredibly important because if the Democratic Party, collectively speaking, wants to be taken seriously, wants to be seen as actual allies to the Me Too movement, they actually do need to hold individuals accountable. So I am pleased to see someone in the Democratic Party, finally face mass calls to resign because we already saw what happened when uh, Tara Reid came forward in 2020 with allegations of sexual assault against Joe Biden. I mean, she was largely uh, disregarded. She was smeared. And I, I think that that's incredibly morally reprehensible. It shows a lack of moral consistency on Democrats. And it's important that they really hold their own accountable here and live up to the principles that they espouse. And on top of that, it's worth noting that CNN also has chosen to not hold one of their own accountable, Chris Cuomo, Andrew Cuomo's brother, who is basically advising his brother on how to deal with sexual harassment allegations after bringing him on multiple times for puff pieces. So it's obviously a conflict of interest, and for CNN to not fire him immediately, given the gravity of the situation and his association with Andrew Cuomo and all of the propaganda that he did for his brother, it's just all around. Like, this story is so gross. So gross. And if you weren't already feeling gross enough, I'm going to leave you with some top-tier cringe from uh, basically Democratic party loyalists who went out of their way to glorify andrew cuomo and um as of the time that i record this video this is uh this is still up so i'll leave you with this get ready to want to jump out of your own skin So obviously, the situation in the country as it relates to the pandemic is looking pretty bleak because COVID cases across the country are on the rise thanks to the Delta variant. But in Florida, the daily average has skyrocketed and hospitalizations have increased by 130 
percent. And as Politico's Matt Dixon and Bruce Ritchie explain, the head of Florida's largest hospital association warned that the skyrocketing number of COVID hospitalizations is unlike anything the state has seen before, even as Governor Ron DeSantis downplays the spike. The Florida Hospital Association on Monday reported 10,389 COVID-19 hospitalizations, the most statewide during any point in the pandemic. This follows CDC reporting over the weekend that the state had more than 21,000 new coronavirus infections on Friday. It was the highest one-day total for Florida, which now makes up roughly one in five new cases nationally. About 95% of those hospitalized are unvaccinated, and Mary Mayhew, the president and CEO of the Florida Hospital Association, said the Delta variant that is sweeping through Florida is infecting young and unvaccinated people and is much different than the previous strain. Now, while the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, has thankfully finally encouraged people to get vaccinated, well, simultaneously, he's doing other things that are literally stopping people from trying to contain the spread of the virus. And I can't read what we're about to read and not come to any other conclusion than Ron DeSantis is is just pro-COVID-19. Like, there's no other way to interpret this. So as Florida's coronavirus infections continue to soar, public health officials and local elected leaders have pressed the DeSantis administration to take more drastic steps to get the virus under control. DeSantis, however, has maintained a strict no-mandate approach to the virus, including touting an executive order last week that prohibits school districts from requiring masks in K-12 facilities. He also vowed to fight any cities or municipalities that try to institute COVID restrictions, including mask mandates or lockdowns. So, I mean, this is pure insanity. Ron DeSantis needs to prove to us whose side he's on. Is he on the side of Florida, Floridians, and humanity? Or is he actually on the side of the virus? Because he's going out of his way to make us less effective at fighting the spread of the virus. Masks work. It's the easiest thing that can be done to try to contain the spread of the virus. And when it comes to K-12 through schools... Many of those children are not eligible to get vaccinated. So he's saying, no, 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 you can't wear masks, even if many of you can't take the vaccine. Those under 11, sorry, I know that you can't get vaccinated, but you also can't wear masks. I mean, this behavior here is sociopathic. It borders on psychopathic behavior. This is just insane. It's insane. Um, And he's doing all of this, putting the lives of children at risk, all to virtue signal to his far right base to run on something to suggest that, you know, he he fought against this woke SJW mask mandate or whatever. He's going to run on this as if it's a positive when people should be looking at him as one of the biggest supervillains on the planet because of all of the blood that he has on his hands. So in the event you're a school in Florida and you don't want to comply with his ban on mask mandates. Well, what happens? Well, you'll be punished. So as CNN reports, Florida's largest school district said it's worried about funding if it does not follow Governor Ron DeSantis' executive order preventing the implementation of mask mandates in schools. Miami-Dade County Public Schools previously said it planned to revisit its mask-optional policy due to new guidelines issued by the U.S. CDC last week that recommended localities encourage all teachers, staff, students, and visitors in schools to wear masks indoors regardless of vaccination status. Miami-Dade the nation's fourth largest school district returns to school August 23rd. So, I mean, if schools in Miami-Dade do the right thing and they require masks, then they get penalized for it. They lose funding. And then, as a result of losing funding, that also makes them less equipped to deal with the virus. They're unable, you know, unable to purchase um, hand sanitizer, soap, other things that they can do to try to mitigate the spread. It's just, the situation is already grim in the united states and throughout the world because of this pandemic and then you have individuals like ron DeSantis going out of their way to make it worse literally fighting on the side of the virus i mean functionally he's pro covid 19 there's no other way to interpret this like there are some republicans in the united states who genuinely want the virus to go on forever seemingly because this gives them more political power they can run on how anti-lockdown they were i'm not necessarily sure what their motivations are but their motivations don't matter what matters is their actions and what they're doing. And what he's doing here is incredibly disgusting. It endangers children, and people are going to die because of this school. And uh, it's sickening. So, 
I mean, you'd think that this would be the death of his political career, given how poorly he's handled COVID-19. But again, because of the sad state of politics in the United States of America, because of how polarized we are, because of we, because of the politicization of the virus, he's going to run on this as if it's some sort of a positive. And that is just so sick and twisted. It really is. I've long maintained that vaccine hesitancy is one of the most serious issues in the United States because if we don't actually reach herd immunity in the United States, then who knows how long this pandemic is going to go on and it's only a matter of time before a new mutation emerges that renders our existing vaccines useless. I would very much like to return to normal, so if you haven't gotten vaccinated, please get vaccinated. Now, the silver lining about the you know Delta variant ravaging you know uh, counties across the country is that it is leading to a little bit of an uptick in vaccinations thankfully now we are a little bit late on our goal biden did say that he wanted at least 70 percent of americans partially vaccinated by july 4th that didn't happen although at least four weeks later we passed 70 percent of the country being partially vaccinated but unfortunately there are going to be areas of the country that are just more vaccine hesitant than other areas and this is going to to get worse in those areas and it's it's really sad to see i don't want people to have to learn the hard way as this family did so i want to share this story with you because this should serve as a wake-up call if you haven't already you know recognized the serious seriousness of uh this virus that don't wait until it's too late Take your health seriously, get vaccinated. So as Nina Golgowski of HuffPost reports, a Nevada woman is sharing her family's heartbreak after her fiance expressed regret about not getting the COVID-19 vaccine shortly before dying from the disease. He was only 39. Our babies now don't have a dad, Jessica Dupree's told Las Vegas station KVVU. You can't say I'm young and it won't affect me because it will. Dupree said she and her fiance, Michael Friedy, wanted to wait until the vaccine had been available for a year to see how it might affect people. There was never any intention to not get it, she said. Shortly after the couple traveled to San Diego for vacation with their five kids, ages 1 to 17, Dupree said Freddie fell ill from a bad sunburn and had to be admitted to an ER. There, he tested positive for COVID-19 and his health went downhill. He's panicking, saying how he doesn't want to die and he doesn't want to leave his babies without a dad, Dupree told USA Today. Scans showed that he contracted pneumonia in both of his lungs. He eventually had to be placed on a ventilator later and against his wishes, forcefully sedated, Dupree said in a GoFundMe post. She told KVVU that his last text message to her was, I should have gotten the damn vaccine. Since Freedy's diagnosis, Dupree said she has gotten vaccinated, as has her oldest child. She is now encouraging anyone who is on the fence about getting the vaccine purely because of side effect concerns to get it. Everybody can have a bad reaction to any vaccine throughout history, but I would take a bad reaction to a vaccine over having to bury my husband, she told CNN. I just, I don't understand why folks are more afraid of a vaccine that a hundred and what, 60 million Americans by now have taken, myself included, and they're more afraid of that than this virus that has killed more than 600,000 Americans. That's not counting people around the globe, but 600,000 people in our country. I just, I don't know how you can possibly think that the virus is less scary than the vaccine. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people who don't want to take the vaccine, um, not necessarily because they're vaccine hesitant or anti-vaxxers, but also because the pandemic, unfortunately, has been politicized, and every single issue in our society is politicized due to polarization in the United States, and this is basically the Republican Party. It's all on them. They're the ones who politicized the pandemic, and now they're dealing with their base basically dying off, and it's, it's shocking to see how inhumane they are, how callous so many Republicans are in the face of widespread death and devastation. I just, I don't get it. Now, when it comes to stubborn people, I think it's worthwhile to try to convince them, even if they're not going to be receptive to our messages. Some people, you're just, you're not going to reach, you're not going to convince them. But some people, I, I think that we should do whatever we can to try to get them to do what's in their own best interest and also in our interest collectively as a society as well as it relates to public health. Um, but one sociologist from Dartmouth College believes that since the pandemic has been politicized, you might actually be able to use negative partisanship to basically, quote, trick people into getting the vaccine 
if they think that they're owning the libs. And I just want you to really think about this, that this is even being talked about, because this is the sad state of affairs in the United States of America. In order to convince people to get a vaccine that is overwhelmingly effective and safe, we have to try to trick people into thinking that they're owning the libs so they get vaccinated so they don't die from this virus. It's just, this is the saddest state of affairs. We are in like the darkest timeline for sure. And this is why I think it's important for um, Democrats to do everything in their power to enforce vaccine passports. You know, um, if your kids are going to return to school, vaccines should be mandatory for people in, a, in, in that household, right? There should be temporary measures. So that way, if you want to go to a movie theater, then yeah, you should have to show your vaccinated status. I think that businesses are within their rights to to do that. Um, and, you know, you might say, well, Mike, that sounds really authoritarian. What about freedom? Well, what about my freedom, right? As Vosh said in his debate with Charlie Kirk, you know, we talk about the freedom of people to not get the vaccine. But what about the freedom of all of us who don't want to live in this perpetual state of disease? We don't want to live with a permanent pandemic. What about our freedom, right? The unvaccinated, they specifically are the ones keeping the rest of us from reaching herd immunity. They are the individuals who are prolonging the duration of this pandemic. So what about the freedom of the rest of society? What about people who want to actually get back to normal and aren't just pretending as if everything is normal because we actually care about others? What about our freedom? You know, it's just this whole situation is really depressing and it's made me lose faith in not just humanity, but especially in the United States. Like any shred of hope that I had that the United States could come together in any capacity, it's it's been demolished because of this pandemic when it's not only politicized, but there are opportunists who go out of their way to score political points by convincing people to do something or not do something that's in their best interest. It's just it's sickening. It's gross, but this is the reality that we live in, live in, so we have to do everything in our power to to fight and and change what's in front of us because this is this is unsustainable. I don't want the vaccine that I took to be rendered useless by a new mutation that is bound to pop up at some point. So for the love of God, get vaccinated, if not for anyone else, for yourself so you don't regret it as this dad did who now has five children who are going to grow up without a father because he chose to wait. Don't wait. Get vaccinated. Well, that's all that I've got for you this week. Uh, thank you all so much for tuning in if you've made it this far. Um, folks, it's really difficult to talk politics right now. I, I know a lot of you feel really demoralized and you just want to check out of politics. And trust me, it is really worthwhile for your mental health to take breaks from time to time. But please do not ever check out disempowering ourselves is the last thing that we need to do. Um, and this is exactly what the Democratic Party establishment wants us to do. So don't disempower ourselves. If anything, fight 10 times harder and uh, give them hell. So that's all I got, folks. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much to our Patreon, PayPal, YouTube, and Twitch subbers. Uh, you all are just truly incredible. You help us not just to survive, but thrive as well. I will see you all next week. I am Mike Figueredo. This has been The Humanist Report. Take care, everyone.